Welcome to the Emergency Medicine Cases Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Anton Hellman, bringing you Canada's brightest minds in emergency medicine from EMC Studios in Toronto. Back in 2013, on episode 37, Anticoagulants, PCCs, and Platelets, we introduced the then cutting-edge NOAX, New Oral Anticoagulants. But there's been a truckload of research and experience with these drugs since then. So fast forward to late 2016, and we no longer call them NOAX, because they're not new anymore, but rather DOAX, Direct Oral Anticoagulants. So here they are. Ready? Dabigatran, brand name Pradaxa, Rivaroxaban, brand name Xarelto, Apixaban, brand name Eliquis, and the newest kid on the block, Adoxaban which isn't yet available in Canada. Well, what else has changed in 2016? Well, in general, we're seeing way more patients taking anticoagulants as we're getting better at picking up thromboembolic disease, and the indications for these drugs are widening. As well, management decisions have become a whole lot more complicated with all these anticoagulation options. We've also got a couple of new reversal agents that we need to know about. So... There's a lot that we need to know about these drugs to minimize the risk of thromboembolism in our patients, while at the same time minimizing their risk of bleeding. You know, pretty much every shift I work, I'm faced with a clinical dilemma related to anticoagulants and thrombosis, or else bleeding. We're dealing with this all the time. We need to know when we can stop these meds safely, how to manage bleeding on these meds, and when to call for help. So with these goals in mind, we've got three truly expert guests on the podcast with us, and I anticipate that they'll have slightly different points of view. We've got the mighty return of my friend and colleague, the walking encyclopedia of EM, Dr. Walter Himmel, who's been lecturing extensively on DOACs over the last few years and probably knows more about non-traumatic bleeding than any eMERGE doc in Canada. Studies have clearly shown that if you've got a patient with active cancer, and they require anticoagulants, there's only one drug presently acceptable, and that's low molecular weight heparin. I'm also pleased to introduce two new voices on EM cases, Dr. Benjamin Bell, internist extraordinaire at the huge community hospital where I work, North York General Hospital, who's got a keen interest in thromboembolic disease and has also been cruising the lecture circuit. Dr. Bell seems to have this amazing kind of calming effect on all the ED staff and patients. He's an absolute pleasure to work with. I think at the very least, this this individual should have had a repeat ultrasound of of her leg at around a week to ensure that there was no progression of what was probably at the time a distal DVT, which subsequently embolized. And last but not least, Dr. Jim Duquetis, perhaps the world's most prolific researcher in thromboembolic disease, or at least in the top three. I checked him out on ResearchGate, actually, and he's got a whopping 324 publications to his name. Dr. Duquetis is an internist and professor from McMaster University in Hamilton, the home of the birth of evidence-based medicine. So it's a true honor of mine to have Dr. Duquetis on the show. The Achilles heel of the Wells score is this component that refers to a viable or equally likely alternative diagnosis. All right, now that you've been introduced to everyone, let's start on the first case on DVT. A 65-year-old, very petite woman with a remote history of colon cancer, otherwise healthy, comes in around midnight to your ED with a big, swollen, tender calf that's developed over the last few days. There's no history of trauma, no history of previous thromboembolic disease or recent surgery, no exogenous estrogen use or fever. You have a very high pretest probability that she has a DVT and you arrange for her to have an ultrasound the next morning to confirm your diagnosis. So first, Dr. Bell, what are your general thoughts about this case? I think you brought up a really good point in that case in that this woman's Wells score isn't through the roof. That being said, the experienced clinician will still have a very high pretest probability that this is in fact a DVT. And so I think that this really highlights the fact that the Wells score is not necessarily the be-all and end-all in terms of pursuing additional diagnostic testing. But the gestalt of an experienced clinician is just as important. And in fact, that's been found in the literature as well. 
Yeah, my understanding is that there has been studies that have shown that gestalt of an experienced collision is as good as the Wells score. That's right. And, you know, the the Achilles heel of the Wells score is this component that refers to a viable or equally likely alternative diagnosis. I think as Ben alluded to, if you don't have that as likely alternative diagnosis, then I think you should pull the trigger in terms of considering empiric anticoagulation and diagnostic testing. And it really highlights the fact that we should be empirically treating these patients, assuming they're not at high risk of bleeding, if we think their pretest probability is high. What would your anticoagulant options be? So assuming that, yes, you're going to start this patient on anticoagulants and you want them to be anticoagulated relatively quickly, what would your choices be? Sure. So in 2016, we have, we, we've got several options for anticoagulating the patient. I think that any one of them is reasonable. And really the key is, is we need a rapidly acting anticoagulant. That's the key in this, in this situation. Generally speaking, my default today is, is to use a direct oral anticoagulant that was tested in the in the acute phase of, of venous thrombosis. And so for me, that would include apixaban or rivaroxaban. However, uh, low molecular weight heparin is also a perfectly viable option in, in this situation as well. You had brought up the issue that, that this is a very petite woman. I'm not sure what the weight of the patient is, but if she truly is absolutely extremely petite, I might think twice about using a direct oral anticoagulant, particularly if that's in combination with the with uh, chronic kidney disease, for example. Uh, but generally speaking, I think a direct oral anticoagulant or low molecular weight heparin, or in very rare cases, unfractionated heparin uh, by intravenous are all reasonable options. If I haven't got a diagnosis, I need a bridge until I have a diagnosis. And traditionally, that was low molecular weight heparin, either an oxaparin or fragment, depending on the hospital you're in. And of course, this presupposes I've done some routine blood work and know what the patient's kidney function is. Now, common sense tells me that as a bridge, I could use a single dose of one of the direct oral anticoagulants, but this is not common practice yet. So I'm not going to do it. So prior to the diagnosis, I will either give a fragment or, a, or an oxaparin, depending on the hospital I'm in. And the drugs I may use once I have a diagnosis will be quite different. Now, I know given the fact that the DOAX will have maximum effect in one to three hours, common sense tells you you could use a pixaban or ivaroxaban. But I, I, that's not the custom yet. I'm not quite going to do that yet. LMW, low molecular heparins, have been used as a bridge for years and years and years. There's lots of evidence behind that and lots of practice experience behind that. I have yet to read a single study that says you can use DOAX as a bridge to the diagnosis or DOAX as a bridge until uh, uh, intervention and so forth. That's why I'm not going to use it. Does common sense, does physiology, does a half-life tell me that you could use a single tablet of a DOAX? Yes, it does. I think it's quite reasonable to empirically treat with a direct oral anticoagulant in lieu of a low molecular weight heparin. Why do I say that? Well, direct oral anticoagulants are simply oral forms of parenteral agents. They both inhibit t factor 10A. So the mechanism is very similar. But I do agree, the caveat is, like in any patient starting on anticoagulation, even for a short period, check their CBC, get a baseline INRPTT and a baseline creatinine. Okay, we've been touching a little bit on uh, how these DOACs work. They work rapidly, we know that. But let's get into a little bit more about the basics of how they work before we get into sort of the nitty-gritty. What are DOACs? How do they work? And in general, is there much of a difference between the four different DOACs that are available in terms of their efficacy to prevent thromboembolism and their bleeding risk? Sure. So the direct part of the DOAC refers to the mechanism of action. Direct inhibition of either uh, factor 10A or uh, factor 2 is the way these agents work. Uh, the direct thrombin inhibitor, dabigatran, prevents the conversion of fibrinogen to fibrin right at the bottom of the ca coagulation cascade. And then one step up, the uh, 10A inhibitors, rivaroxaban and apixaban, prevent the conversion of prothrombin to thrombin. 
Direct means that they work directly to inhibit these coagulation functions as opposed to indirect anticoagulants like heparin, low molecular weight heparin, fonda paranox, which require an intermediate step, that being antithrombin, to inactivate them. So they work in a different way than our indirect anticoagulants, and of course they work in a different way compared to our, our vitamin K antagonists like warfarin, which deplete the clotting factors 2, 7, 9, and 10. Now, what's the evidence that they are better than our conventional uh, management, which would involve a low molecular weight heparin as a bridge to warfarin? And there have been several studies that have looked at individual uh, DOAX compared to conventional treatment, and there have been meta-analyses that have combined these studies together. And the bottom line here is that the approach where one uses a DOAC alone versus that of a low molecular weight heparin and warfarin, the efficacy is pretty well a saw off. So there's really no difference in terms of one approach versus the other in terms of preventing recurrent venous thromboembolism. Where there might be a slight difference is on the safety side. The, the DOAX might give you a slight advantage in terms of bleeding risk, and by slight I mean about a 1% absolute risk reduction. So you, know, you can calculate your NNT accordingly. Having said that, there are two DOACs where you can't just use a standalone DOAC approach, and these are dabigatran, and if we see it in next year, adoxaban, they require a five to seven day bridge period with low molecular weight heparin before you can start the patient on dabigatran uh, or adoxaban. So overall, similar efficacy, maybe a slightly better safety advantage. Okay. This is great. I mean, we're going to be getting into the details of bleeding risk in terms of intracranial bleeding versus GI bleeding. So we'll get into that later. And we'll also get into the details of the contraindications when you don't want to use the DOAX. But I think that's a a pretty good sort of introduction. Dr. Himmel, let's talk about all the factors that you consider when you're about to give a DOAC as opposed to uh, low molecular weight, heparin, and warfarin. Another way as- of asking the question is, what are the key elements of a good history in the ED to help us decide on whether this patient should get a DOAC or not? Well, I'll be very specific. You absolutely must check kidney function because once you've got a GFR of under 30 cc's per a minute, you're not going to use the DOACs. There may be a minimal exception to that, not even worth mentioning. Secondly, you've got to see what drugs the patient's on. Aspirin, Plavix, NSAIDs. Uh, These drugs are probably not a great idea. Now, most of the studies have had patients, a certain number of patients take the DOAC plus 81 milligrams of aspirin if indicated. But if patients are on NSAIDs or taking 325 of aspirin, you've got to really carefully determine if you want to make a decision or get some help about that one. You have to ask the patient about compliance. The DOACs have a fairly rapid onset, which is great. But they have on the average a half-life of 12 hours, which means if you miss a DOAC for 24 hours or 36 hours, you're basically no longer anticoagulated. So you've got to have a discussion where you tell the patient you've got to be consistent. Are you compliant with your medication? Hmm. So patients who you know aren't going to be compliant or very unlikely to be compliant, DOACs probably aren't your best choice? Those patients are going to be a problem no matter what. DOAX might not be your best choice because now you basically have no way of monitoring them. So, so far we've talked about kidney function, we've talked about compliance, and we've talked about drug interactions. What are some of the other things that you, you need to take in a good ED history uh, when you're deciding whether to give I think you have to do a review of systems. For example, do they have a history of ulcers or bleeding or gastric distress? Because some of the DOAX, probably the bigger trend more than the others, may give you gastric distress. So that's worthwhile knowing. You have to ask about uh, a history of uh, cancer treatment, uh, previous bowel bleeding and so forth. That could be an issue. So what what is it specifically about cancer uh, and DOACs? So that's a very, very important point. Um, Studies have clearly shown that if you've got a patient with active cancer and they require anticoagulants, there's only one drug presently acceptable, and that's low 
molecular weight heparin. Okay, and, and why is that exactly, Dr. Ducatis? Why is it that DOACs are contraindicated in patients with active cancer? They're not contraindicated, uh, Anton, but it's, relating, it's related to the evidence that we have. Pretty well, all the evidence that we have on treating cancer-associated thrombosis involves the use of low molecular weight heparin. And until there are trials that look at DOACs in that population, we've got good evidence with low molecular weight heparin. We know also this is a challenging population because they're at risk for both recurrent thrombosis and bleeding. Let's go with the proven evidence-based choice until evidence with DOACs are available. Can I just interject one thing there? Of course, in this situation, we're talking about uh, acute venous thrombosis. I think that in the context of atrial fibrillation, in the case of active malignancy, I think most people would still feel comfortable in that situation with a direct oral anticoagulant. I agree with everything that Walter said. The other thing that we don't want to overlook when taking a history before we start a patient on a DOAC is concomitant medications beyond the antiplatelets and the NSAIDs. Why do I say this? Because, yes, the DOACs have fewer, far fewer drug-drug interactions than warfarin. We know that. But they still do have drug interactions. For example, patients on anticonvulsants, Dilantin, Tegretol, uh, less commonly on antifungals, uh, certain antibiotics. If those patients are receiving one or more of those drugs, especially on a long-term basis, then your DOAC may not be a good choice. What are some of the big antibiotics? Because we use tons of antibiotics in the emergency department. Are there kind of like the big three antibiotics that you want to avoid? The important ones are the macrolides, so erythromycin, clarithromycin, uh, anti-tuberculosis medications, not so commonly used, but rifampin have strong interactions, drug interactions with DOACs. Uh, Antiretroviral drugs are also another class that we need to be uh, cognizant about. And in the cardiac realm, not so commonly, but things like antiarrhythmics, potentially amiodarone, but it's really important for that to be on your checklist. So those are the important other drugs to know about in patients on DOAX or you're thinking of putting on DOAX. Now, Dr. Duquettis is going to talk about extremes of weight when it comes to DOAX. Anton, I want to cycle back to dealing with treatment in patients who are at the extremes of body weight. And we sometimes deal with underweight patients, less than 50 kilos, but more commonly, especially in North America, we're dealing with the the very obese patients. And I just had a patient a week ago, 240 kilograms. Mind you, we're we're a a bariatric surgical center, so we see these, these folks. But I think it's important to underscore that there's very little evidence about using DOACs in patients with those extremes. So by that, I mean less than 50 kilos, uh, more than 120 kilos. And let's take an example of a, a very obese person, 125 or 130 kilos. I personally would be reticent to administer the standard dose DOAC in such an over uh, body weight p- person uh, because I don't know if they're getting enough of an anticoagulant effect. So your options would be to go to the conventional approach, which is low microwave heparin and then warfarin adjusted according to the INR. And then you could also, although I would not recommend it, you could measure the anticoagulant effect of the DOAX. And I know we're going to talk about that a little bit later, but I probably would go to option A in those very obese patients and maybe in the very underweight, like less than 40 to 50 kilo patients. Okay, so in this very petite woman with an obvious DVT, you may opt to use warfarin for that exact reason. Less than 50 kilos, I might be a little bit uh, nervous giving the standard dose of a DOAC. Hmm. Okay, so we've got a pretty big checklist here. This is not easy. So we've got renal function. uh, We've got extremes of age. We've got any bleeding history. We've got other so-called blood thinners or NSAIDs. Uh, We've got other medications like anticonvulsants, macrolides, HIV meds, a cancer history, if we're talking about thromboembolism. Not that it's a contraindication, but that there's really no good data out there. 
I think there's only two that we haven't talked about yet. One is liver disease and one is pregnancy. Uh, Dr. Himmel, what is it about liver disease that makes DOACs a contraindication? Liver disease is a challenge. DOACs have two forms of metabolism, renal, more so with the bigotran, but they're also metabolized by the cytochrome system. So if you've got very significant liver disease, uh, probably a very elevated bilirubin or LFTs that are three or four times normal, your DOAC levels could be much higher than you anticipate. This, this might be one area for not using a DOAC. If your INR is 1 or 1.1 or 1.2, and if your LFTs are less than three times elevated, you're okay with DOACs. So in terms of baseline lab tests, we're going to be doing a CBC to look for anemia, thrombocytopenia. We're going to be doing a creatinine and calculating a GFR because if it's under 30, that's a contraindication to DOACs. And if it's getting close to 30, we might want to be really careful. We want to get not only an INR, but a PTT as well, because especially if someone requires heparin, we'll need that baseline PTT. You might also discover um, a, an underlying bleeding disorder uh, or a thrombotic disorder. And then finally, you might want to consider liver enzymes uh, in patients who are at risk for liver failure. Now, let's get into a little bit of the nuances of the different kinds of DVTs we might run into. So, Dr. Himmel, let's say you get the ultrasound the next day for this woman, and it shows a below-knee DVT, so an isolated distal DVT. How would that change your management? Well, the first thing I want to say is there's two sorts of radiologists and two sorts of hospitals. There's the ones that do entire leg Dopplers, that they will do ultrasound of your entire leg, including your calf. And there's some hospitals that just do the knee and above. So you have to know what your radiologist is doing. That's absolutely essential for follow-up. So let's say you're at North York General, where they do the entire leg. Traditionally, if you had a DVT, that's in plain where it's a clot involving your tibial veins or your peroneal vein, traditionally, the treatment was not anticoagulation. It was observation to see if it progresses in a week or two weeks' time. So now you've got to decide, are you going to treat or are you not going to treat? And the answer is, like many things in medicine, it depends. So here are the factors you might consider. Are all three veins involved? You'll probably treat. Are the veins that are involved very close to your popliteal vein? you're probably going to treat. Is the patient symptomatic? Is their leg painful? Is it swollen? You'll probably want to treat. And then you have to have a chat with the patient. You've got to see what they value. Are they concerned about bleeding or are they concerned about a progression of their DVT? Uh, and, and can you just give us maybe some numbers in general of what the chances of a PE happening in these patients with distal sure. isolated well, calf DVTs? The numbers DVTs? I've heard generally speaking is if you have a DVT below the knee, the chance of progressing to the knee or above is in the realm of 15 to 20%. If you have a DVT above the knee, the number I've heard in terms of PE all comers is about 50%. Well, 15 or 20% for distal DVTs. I mean, that's... Go proximally. We'll go proximal. That's pretty significant. I mean, I'm... So I, if you're not going to treat, they need follow-up. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so certainly if they're very symptomatic, if there's all three veins involved in the distal leg, uh, if it's close to the popliteal vein, and yeah, as we talked about in our EBM episode with, with Dr. Himmel, their values. If I could just add in a couple of more factors to think about, if a patient uh, has a distal DVT that is unprovoked, if you've done a D-dimer for whatever reason and it's positive, or if the patient has a distal DVT that was provoked but by a, but by a risk factor that's still present, for example, the patient had trauma and then leg swelling or they're still, and, and or they're still immobile, then those would all be factors that I would associate with progression and I would lean on the side of treatment in those, in those uh, patients, particularly if they're at low risk of bleeding. Yeah, I agree with uh, what what Ben has said. Uh, having said that, though, there are no randomized placebo-controlled trials of anticoagulation versus no anticoagulation for isolated calf DVT. The practice guidelines provide a weak 
recommendation, like a 2C recommendation in favor of treatment. And I think these caveats are, are very sensible. And the only other point I would mention, as as Walter indicated, is some sites are doing these below-knee ultrasounds, and they're really good at it. And they can pick up really small clots in the muscular veins or, you know, a one or two centimeter segment in one of the tibial veins. And you need to be careful not to just automatically treat all these clots that are probably not destined to cause problems to the patient. So just to summarize there, approximately 15 to 20 percent of identified isolated calf DVTs will progress proximally. And the suggested indications for anticoagulation treatment for isolated calf DVTs which are kind of a weak recommendation on the guidelines and what our experts suggest in their opinion are the following seven things. One, if all three deep veins are involved. Two, if the clot is close to the popliteal vein. Three, if the patient has severe symptoms. Four, if the clot is greater than five centimeters in length. Five, if they've had a previous venous thromboembolism, six, if they have a positive D-dimer, and lastly, if there's progression of the DVT on repeat imaging. Next, Dr. Bell's going to tell a story that drives home the point that if your hospital does only above-knee DVTs and you still suspect a DVT, all those patients require a follow-up ultrasound in one week to rule out a progression of an isolated distal DVT. So this is a 42-year-old woman who who had very heavy uh, menses for a long time. And her menstrual periods got quite a bit worse, and she was feeling weak and faint. And so she went and had a CBC drawn, and her hemoglobin was 55. She was feeling well, but for better or worse, she got, of course, uh, a unit of packed red cells was started on the birth control pill and tranexamic acid to deal with this heavy menstrual bleeding. Now, to me, that sounds like a a recipe for a DVT. And indeed, a couple of days later, she came back to that hospital because she was having swelling of her left leg. She had an ultrasound done of the leg, and there was no DVT seen. And that ultrasound, in keeping with practice guidelines, was above the knee only. She she was provided with reassurance and uh, discharge from the emergency room. About 10 days later, she presented to our institution with a life-threatening pulmonary embolism. And so I think what that case highlights is uh, follow-up for suspected DVT is extremely important. First of all, no test is perfect, and the, and the sensitivity and specificity of ultrasound for proximal DVT is very, very high. So it's unlikely that this woman had a proximal DVT. However, it's possible, and if the clinical situation really suggests it, then repeating the ultrasound irrespective of the result, would be, would be something to at least consider. But I think at the very least, this, this individual should have had a repeat ultrasound of, of her leg at around a week to ensure that there was no progression of what was probably at the time a distal DVT, which subsequently embolized. And so that's why, as Dr. Hemmel says, you really need to know whether your institution is doing whole leg or proximal-only scans, because if they're doing proximal-only scans and your pretest probability for a DVT is high, you must, must repeat that ultrasound at uh, one week to make sure that they didn't have a distal, which subsequently propagated as what happens in 15 to 20 percent of cases. Great. And you've got another option, of course. In addition to that, get a D-dimer. Right. If their D-dimer is really low and you've got a sensitive D-dimer, you can actually probably stop there, presupposing we're not taking tons of procoagulant medications. If that D-dimer is elevated, whoa, that person needs to follow up at a week and maybe even begin at two weeks. So you've got to know your radiology and you've got to know your institution. It's that important. I want to continue with our discussion on variations on DVT. So we've talked about the classic DVT. We've talked about the distal DVT. Let's throw in there the superficial venous thrombosis. So not a DVT anymore, an SVT, so to speak, a superficial venous thrombosis. The other SVT. Yeah, the other SVT. Like let's say you have a patient who has an obvious superficial thrombosis on exam. 
uh, and the you do a duplex ultrasound, it shows no DVT. Do any of these patients need to be anticoagulated? I mean, I could tell you that, you know, 15 years ago when I started uh, doing emergency medicine, we never anticoagulated these patients. Have things changed in terms of, of anticoagulation for these patients? So I think that you need to consider the clinical situation. I, I, I agree that anticoagulation is not indicated all the time for these patients, but I think like distal DVT, there are instances where anticoagulation should be considered. So, for example, if a patient is extremely symptomatic, I think an intermediate dose of an anticoagulant for a period of, of a month to six weeks may be a reasonable option to, to help allay their symptoms. I think that if the superficial venous thrombosis is very close to the saphenofemoral junction, I would think very carefully uh, about anticoagulating that patient. And that's because if that uh, superficial venous thrombosis makes its way into the femoral vein, all of a sudden you've gone from a relatively perhaps benign diagnosis to a quite a significant proximal DVT. And so I think that if it's close to the saphenofemoral junction, anticoagulation should be strongly considered. I also think that the concept that superficial venous thrombosis is a completely benign disease is a, somewhat of a misnomer. Firstly, like uh, deep vein thrombosis and pulmonary embolism, there are, all, there are also associations with underlying malignancy. But more notably, superficial uh, vein thrombosis is also also associated with pulmonary embolism as well. In terms of the literature, there are studies looking at uh, use of low-dose heparins, either um, fondaparinox as an example versus placebo for the treatment of SVT, not, not the cardiac SVT. And it uh, shows there is symptomatic improvement and, as Ben alluded to, reduction in the progression to proximal DVT. But I think the needle overall is shifted towards treating these patients. They're symptomatic. They've got a swollen, hot, tender leg a lot of the times, and the best way to treat them is with a low-dose anticoagulant. If the clot is less extensive, you could try maybe a topical NSAID, but a lot of these patients will benefit for a few weeks. And this is where it becomes a bit empiric. How long do you treat them for? Two to four weeks, I think, is very sensible depending on how extensive it is. And as Ben said, you know, are, is it close to that adductor canal that, and could it become proximal? And again, as with the other types of patients, follow up to see that they're improving and to ensure that they're not progressing. Mm -hmm. So Dr. Himmel, could you just review for us then from the ED perspective, what the indications for treatment for these superficial thromboses are? Like which ones would you pretty sure you treat? Okay. So yeah. I've got a few points to make. The first point is the following. The superficial femoral vein is not a superficial vein. The superficial femoral vein is a deep vein, and the name should no longer be used. So you've got the deep femoral vein, and you've got the femoral vein. And wow, they both that's form confusing. The so if a radiologist tells you that there's the superficial it's femoral thrombose. vein is thrombosis, that that's DVT. actually a deep vein thrombosis. Oh, that's a deep vein. Yes. Okay, now, wow. That's... It's, it's a big tragedy that five or 600 years ago, when they started dissecting people's legs, someone called the superficial femoral vein the superficial vein because they were contrasting it with the deep femoral vein. Okay. The superficial femoral vein is a deep vein. Okay, don't get caught with that one. It the groin and okay. goes to the knee. You will save a life if you just know that point. Next. Okay. It's a, it's a clinical exam. Feel the superficial vein. If someone, when you have a superficial phlebitis or a superficial thrombophlebitis, you can feel the thing easily. Palpate the vein. Is it half a centimeter long, minimally tender, barely palpable? You can probably observe that. Is it five or six centimeters long? Is it thick and nodular? Is it symptomatic? That's a big deal, superficial thrombophlebitis. So if I feel a vein, and you can usually trace them from the beginning to the end surprisingly easily. If I feel a vein and it's, it's long, nodular tender part is long, or it's thick, or it's hard, or it's super tender, certainly five centimeters long is super tender, I will tend to treat that, <clears throat> both above and below the knee. And of course, history is important. Are they on the birth control pill? Were they recently placed on cyclic apron? The history is really, really important there. So I've had some experience in treating the superficial veins in the thigh where patients have had 
a vein perhaps four or five, six, seven centimeters long and quite tender. And I've sent them to our, our medical clinic for follow-up or, you know, Dr. Bell's seen them. And the rate of improvement is dramatic, unbelievably dramatic. I sent other patients with superficial vein come back a couple of these later, and it was pretty large to begin with, and they're much worse. So feel the vein from start to beginning. Is it more than four or five centimeters long? Is it tender? Is it thick? Is it nodular? Are there risk factors? And the answer is yes. Consider treating it and getting early follow-up. I think that, that addressing the question of birth control at some point through, through some means is important. I think that quite frequently women come into the emergency department, they're on the birth control pill, they're diagnosed with a venous thrombosis of some sort, they're starting on anticoagulants and concurrently very often told to stop taking the birth control pill. I think that it is appropriate for them to come off the birth control pill perhaps at some point in the future. However, I think that if you're that if you're starting an anticoagulant, that any prothrombotic effect that the birth control pill has will be vastly outweighed by the therapeutic anticoagulation that the patient is getting. And generally speaking, in fact, I think that most of those patients should be continued on the birth control pill while they're on the anticoagulant until things are sorted out for a couple of reasons. At least number number one, that birth control pill won't result in any worsening of the of the DVT or PE because they're being anticoagulated. Additionally, the direct oral anticoagulant should not be used in pregnant patients. They're small molecules that will certainly pass the placenta and cause who knows what kind of damage to a developing fetus. And so any kind of uh, birth control is, is, a, is a good idea in these patients. And I always counsel them that, by the way, they, they should be using barrier protection as well. Uh, and, and so I think that we should be avoiding stopping birth control pill just because they have a clot if, if they're being anticoagulated. That's a great pearl. So Dr. Ducatis, let's say you do decide that you're going to treat someone who comes to the emergency department with a superficial venous thrombosis. What are you going to start them on? First of all, you would probably want to avoid the DOAX in this situation because we just don't have any evidence. What I would do and what most my colleagues would do is st start with a prophylactic dose of a low molecular weight heparin. For example, Daltaparin 5,000 units once a day or enoxaparin 40 milligrams once a day. And then it, you can consider higher doses, uh, let's say 7,500 of daltaparin if that superficial thrombophlebitis is very extensive near the uh, adductor canal. But by comparison, a therapeutic dose of daltaparin would be between 12,500 and 17,000. So you're using about a third to, you know, two-fifths of the therapeutic dose. And that should work for most patients. Okay, great. So that's a quick, easy thing we can do then. So for patients with superficial venous thrombosis uh, that are big and symptomatic, uh, that we decide that we are going to treat in the emergency department, there's no role yet for DOAX, we don't have any good studies. So low molecular weight heparin, you want to be using about one-third, two-fifths the dose. Unless you're really worried about them, you might you might inch it up a little bit higher until they get follow-up in your thrombosis clinic or your internal medicine clinic. So that's all we're going to talk about uh, DVTs. Let's move on to the second case. Case number two, a 66-year-old woman with a history of diabetes and remote GI bleed comes in with isolated palpitations for 14 hours and is found to be in rapid atrial fibrillation at 140 beats per minute. After a thorough history and physical, along with some shared decision-making, she's successfully electrically converted in the ED. So as we discussed in our AFib episode with Ian Steele a couple of years ago, the big paradigm shift in anticoagulation for patients with paroxysmal AFib is that ED physicians should prescribe anticoagulants to at-risk AFib patients before they leave the ED rather than leaving it up to their primary care doc or a cardiologist in follow-up. So first, Dr. Himmel, what's the reasoning for this? Well, it all depends on the patient, but there's probably two or three reasons. Reason number one, if the patient leaves the hospital on an anticoagulant and their TAS2 score is one or more and they need one, they're likely going to stay on it. 
if the patient leaves the hospital no anticoagulant, there's a good chance they will never go on anticoagulant, at least until their next episode of fibrillation. So if you put them on the right track, you've given them momentum to take anticoagulation, assuming you've had a discussion. So right away, they're moving in the right direction. So you've set a good precedent for a good trend. That's number one. Number two, the traditional teaching has been that if you have atrial fibrillation less than 48 hours, your chance of throwing a claw is extremely small, if not zero. The traditional teaching is wrong. There was a study called the Finnish Cardioversion Study, published in JAK, the Journal of the American College of Cardiology, which showed that about 4% of people with atrial fibrillation under 48 hours have a clot. I was amazed at this study that pretty clearly shows that people who have been in AFib for more than 12 hours, not 48, are actually at pretty high risk for throwing a clot. Well, the number they give is about 1%. So if you're only cardioverting 10 patients a year, you're not going to see it. With large po populations, it's going to happen. So you want to get the patient on the right trend. Some patients are at risk of throwing a clot. Those are two very good reasons. So not every patient is going to start an anticoagulant. If the patient's CHAS2 score is zero, and they've been drinking heavily, and they're otherwise super healthy, that's the person you're not going to put in anticoagulation necessarily, and you probably won't. The third reason is atrial stunning. People who are in atrial fibrillation, even for a brief time period, may have atrial stunning. So because of atrial stunning, because of the risk of having a clot, because of the long-term presence you've established, it's important to consider putting these patients on anticoagulation. So if their TATS2 score is one or more, my starting point is to start them with anticoagulation and then prove to me I shouldn't. That's my starting point. Now, of course, it's a history, physical, discussion, contraindications, and early follow-up. Okay. If that's not persuasive, I don't know what is. So, Because there's still docs out there that I speak to who are reluctant to start patients on anticoagulants in the emergency department for AFib. So uh, that was some great reasoning there. So just to remind our listeners of the CHAD-65 decision instrument that we discussed with Ian Steele last time on EM Cases, Dr. Bell, what are the indications for starting anticoagulants for stroke prevention in patients who present to the ED with rapid AFib? And just remember, just to preempt this, it's going to be almost everyone. That's right, Anton. It is almost everyone who requires anticoagulation who have not just rapid atrial fibrillation, but in fact any form of atrial fibrillation. And the 2014 version of the Canadian Cardiovascular Society guidelines, which was uh, emphasized again in the, in the recently published 2016 version of the Canadian Cardiovascular Society AFib guidelines, made things very simple. If you have atrial fibrillation and you're over the age of 65, you should be anticoagulated irrespective of CHAD score. So if you're 66 years old and have atrial fibrillation but no other risk factors on the CHAD's tool, then the Canadian Cardiovascular Society says that you should be anticoagulated. Certainly all patients with a CHAD score of 1 should be anticoagulated irrespective of age. And if they are, make sure they're on the right dose. All right. So any patient over 65 with AFib should be anticoagulated. And that's not just aspirin, which isn't an anticoag anticoagulant. And especially if they're CHADS2, if they have any CHADS2 risk factors, which are previous stroke, hypertension, heart failure, or diabetes. Or age greater than 75. And so that's where the CHADS65 mnemonic comes from. It's, it, so CHADS, any one of the CHADS scores, or age 65 or greater. Got it. Okay. And just to remind the listeners that if the patient has valvular atrial fibrillation, that is a mechanical heart valve or rheumatic valve disease, that they should be started on warfarin, not the DOAX. So we're going to be putting a lot of patients on these anticoagulants. So of course, in the emergency department, we're going to be seeing a lot more bleeding. We had mentioned a little bit about the DOAX in terms of their efficacy compared to each other and their bleeding risk when it comes to venous thromboembolism. What about in AFib? Dr. Duquetis, in general, are all the DOAX pretty similar in their efficacy and bleeding risk when it comes to stroke prevention in AFib? This is a really important uh, question, Anton, because 
both healthcare professionals and and patients often ask you if I'm going to be on a DOAC, which which one of these should I take? And if you actually look at the the evidence and look at the totality of it, I think the conclusions are as follows: Number one, that the DOACs are at least as efficacious in some cases more efficacious than warfarin to prevent stroke and systemic embolism. Number two, that they are at least as as safe as warfarin in terms of mitigating the risk for major bleeding. But the one thing that's really striking is this, and this is a finding that was totally unexpected, is that all the DOACs consistently are associated with a decreased risk of intracranial hemorrhage, which we know is uncommon, half of 1% to 1%, but potentially devastating. And I I wondered if I could just explain that because I think there's a really cool hypothesis to explain this observation, which we've seen across the board. I, I want you to imagine an elderly brain with some atherosclerosis. And we know from MRI studies that about 10% to 15% of those patients have microbleeds. We've seen these on MRI, but we hadn't seen them before on CT. Now imagine those microbleeds occurring. They release tissue factor. They activate factor seven, causing a burst in that coagulation function, and those bleeds get sopped up. Now, if you're in a DOAC, the DOAC doesn't affect your factor seven levels. So those little small bleeds will be mopped up and controlled. On the other hand, if you're on warfarin, it's inhibiting factors two, nine, 10, and seven. That burst of factor seven is blunted by warfarin. And it's possible that the warfarin is in fact exacerbating those micro bleeds And that is why the DOACs are safer uh, in that regard. Wow. That's a great point. And of course, you know, the figures we read about intracranial hemorrhage are half a percent, one percent a year. But I can tell you from experience, also what I've read, if you're looking at patients who are 80, 85 years of age, their risk of intracranial hemorrhage is a lot more than one percent a year. It can be two and three percent a year. So that's a big issue. And even without an antidote, meta-analysis have demonstrated DOACs are safer even without the antidote. You get less intracranial bleeding, and if you bleed, you get less death. Yeah, we had talked about this on one of the previous episodes. And the way I think about these things is if you're 80 or 90 years old and you have an intracranial bleed, you're done. Whether you accept that you've got octoplex to reverse warfarin and that the, the DOACs, the new reversal agents, we don't have much experience with yet. We don't know how well they work yet. I think that's sort of all irrelevant when it comes to intracranial bleeds. In my opinion, having a lower intracranial bleed rate with DOACs is the important part. Because once you do have an intracranial bleed, and especially if you're elderly, there's very, very, very few of those patients who will have a reasonable functional outcome regardless of what you do or what anticoagulant you're taking. Absolutely. So the best treatment is don't bleed in the first place. Exactly. So that's a bit about intracranial bleeding. Let's talk about GI bleeding where DOACs are not as safe as warfarin. Dr. Dukaitis, could you just review for us the literature on DOACs compared to warfarin when it comes to the safety in terms of GI bleeding? Some DOACs, in particular uh, dabigatran and rivaroxaban, may cause more gastrointestinal bleeding than warfarin. Uh, In the case of dabigatran, it may be because this drug is poorly absorbed, so it it sort of bathes, if you will, the the GI tract, and if you've got some little lesion there, it's going to make it overt. With rivaroxaban, we're not sure but it may relate to a similar effect or its sort of peak, uh, higher peak effect. Okay, I think this would be an opportune moment to discuss any conflicts of interest, which I forgot to discuss at the top of the podcast. So let's just go through each of you one by one, because of course we want to be as objective as possible on EM cases, and that's what I strive for. Walter, I understand that you've been offered money from uh, drug companies and 
and what you, and you've never taken a penny. Is that is that right? <laughs> I've offered money on many occasions, and I said no. I've never received a cent in my wallet from any drug company. Okay. So Dr. Himmel has no conflicts of interest to declare. Dr. Decatis, if you have 324 publications, I imagine there's got to be some conflict of interest sitting in there somewhere. Well, of course. And like many of my colleagues, we have funding from government sources. So that is a potential conflict. And we engage in a lot of educational activities through industry-sponsored activities, and I have a number of those. Uh, What I try to do personally is take some of that money and feed it back to research because the government, frankly, just doesn't give you enough. But I have had involvement with at least seven or ten pharmaceutical industries in various capacities. All right. And Dr. Bell? I've received funding for speaking on behalf of all of the makers of the direct oral anticoagulants, more or less equally, and so I am conflicted in in that regard. I'm also a member, a proud member, I should say, of Thrombosis Canada, and so I've mentioned them a couple of times during this podcast, and so you should know that I'm a very proud member of that of that organization. Okay. And just to clarify, Thrombosis Canada is a, is a non-profit oh, oh, organization. Oh, yeah. So, 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 so my role with Thrombosis Canada is completely unpaid. Let's move on to actually starting the anticoagulants for AFib in the ED. Let's just go through sort of a practical, we've cargo this patient with AFib, they're over 65 years old, and they've got diabetes. We definitely want to start anticoagulants in the ED. Uh, let's say their creatinine is normal, there's no obvious contraindications. How are you going to start them? Uh, what are your options? So unlike in venous thrombosis, there's no need to ensure that the patient is anticoagulated therapeutically immediately. And so in this situation, it would be reasonable to use a slowly acting anticoagulant, for example, warfarin. If you're going to be using warfarin, you should ensure the patient has follow-up with their family physician within the next three days so INR monitoring can commence at that point. You should know, however, that the Canadian Cardiovascular Society, because of the reasons we've already discussed, most notably reduction in intracranial hemorrhage and reduction in uh, mortality, if you are to have a bleed, recommend the direct oral anticoagulants first over warfarin in eligible patients, and just make sure that you're using it at the proper dose. And so you can use the Thrombosis Canada app to calculate which uh, dose uh, of the direct oral anticoagulant that you should be using. Now, of course, if the patient needs to be anticoagulated therapeutically immediately thereafterwards, then of course you should be using a, a, a bridging strategy or a direct oral anticoagulant. For example, in the patient who has had longer standing uh, atrial fibrillation, who's being cardioverted after a period of, of anticoagulation, that patient should be immediately on an antithrombotic agent. And I wouldn't recommend warfarin in that situation unless they came in already therapeutic. So it's important to remember that the DOAC dosing is different for venous thromboembolism than it is for AFib. We'll have all the dosing in the written summary on the Agile MD app on Dropbox and my Evernote. And remember that on Shift, you can use the Thrombosis Canada app. Now, when it comes to dosing DOAX, it's also important to know that for venous thromboembolism, the dosing is fixed as opposed to a fib where it's adjusted based on renal function and BMI. Now back to the case. Now, this woman, Dr. Hamill, had a remote history of GI bleed. Is this a contraindication to DOAX? I mean, we come across this kind of thing all the time. Like, let's say she had an ulcer with a GI bleed 20 years ago, but she's been totally fine ever since. How do you assess the bleeding risk in AFib patients in general that you're going to start on anticoagulation? Well, you can do it clinically or you can use a score. And if you go to the app, there's a couple of scores. Probably the one that's most used in Canada is the has blood score. Look basically at liver disease, kidney disease, previous bleeding, previous strokes, uh, hypertension. These are all risk factors for bleeding. But if you're going to talk about GI bleeding, there's a few questions we've got to ask. Was the person taking aspirin or Plavix at the time? Were they taking NSAIDs at the time? Have they been treated for H. pylori? It's not all that simple, actually. 
I would also add that I would not be using the HasBled score as a uh, reason not to anticoagulate a patient who should be on anticoagulation to prevent a stroke. There are a couple of, of reasons for that. Number one, strokes are often irreversible and associated with significant morbidity and mortality, especially when they occur in association with atrial fibrillation. We can usually treat a bleed, and the, and the morbidity and mortality associated with a major bleed is much, much less than the morbidity and mortality associated with a major AFib-associated stroke. And so rather than comparing, well, you know, their HasBled score is 2, but their CHAS score is 1, so I'm not going to anticoagulate, for example. That's not how the HasBled score should be used. The HasBled score should be used to highlight reversible risk factors for bleeding and address them. Treat their hypertension to target. Have the patient abstain from alcohol. Avoid non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medications or concomitant antiplatelet medications. If the, if the patient has a labile INR, perhaps consider the use of a direct oral anticoagulant instead of warfarin. So the, as I say, the HasBled score should be used to highlight reversible risk factors for bleeding rather than as a, an excuse not to anticoagulate a patient. I really want to highlight uh, what Ben just said, and and here's why. About 30 to 40 percent of patients in the atrial fibrillation trials were receiving an antiplatelet drug, typically aspirin, and in the majority of those patients, they really don't have a good indication for receiving an antiplatelet drug. And we know from these large studies that the addition of an antiplatelet drug does not, I repeat, does not improve the antithrombotic efficacy to prevent or reduce the risk of stroke, but we do know that it does increase the risk for bleeding. So, you know, one simple thing you can do is in a lot of patients, unless they have, let's say, a coronary stent or a recent MI, stop their aspirin or stop their Plavix and you're having their risk for major bleeding. Where I think the low-hanging fruit is patients who are taking aspirin for primary prevention, where we know the evidence is really weak, uh, or who have stable coronary artery disease in the absence of a stent and have been treated medically, in whom we know that anticoagulation works. So, Walter, I'm sure you have an opinion on this since uh, you've, you've stated publicly many times that you yourself have a stent. What's your, what's your take on it? So I'm talking from the point of view of the emergency physician. And I'll make a couple of basic points. If your patient's had a stent for less than a year and you're going to start them anticoagulation, there are so many issues, I would speak to somebody. Was it a drug eluding stent? Was it a 5 millimeter stent or a 3 millimeter stent? Anybody that was stent for less than a year on aspirin or dual antiplatelet therapy, don't be stopping these drugs speak to an expert, speak to the cardiologist, get a consultation. Now, with someone who's had a heart attack in the past, a year, two, three, four, or five years ago, and they're on aspirin alone, and you're going to start from anticoagulation, I certainly would say that maximal dose of aspirin is 81 milligrams a day in Canada. So if you're completely free, and a patient at ASA, you're going to start on a DOAC, you can tell them, don't take a 325 milligram aspirin pill, which, by the way, is really cheap. Take the baby aspirin, which is not really cheap. That's the right dose. I would not advise any emergency doctor with a patient who has known coronary artery disease who is an aspirin and whom you're going to put on DOAX, I would advise the emergency doctor to not stop the aspirin 81 for a couple of reasons. Number one, get a consultation. Number two, it's controversial. Number three, between 10 to 20 percent of patients and the relied trial and the bigger trend were in aspirin 81 milligrams. Don't be stopping that on your own. So you've, you've really got to get a second opinion about that. The expertise, the controversy, the upside and downside is a big deal. So I would get a consultation there. But certainly feel completely free to tell patients taking 325 of aspirin every two days or 325 every day reduces 81. And certainly if they're taking it for primary prevention, stop it. That's for sure. So let's just clarify that. For patients with a coronary stent placed within the last year or an MI who are on antiplatelet medications and you're deciding whether or not to stop their antiplatelet agent and starting them on anticoagulation for stroke prevention for atrial fibrillation, 
what our experts are recommending is to consult a cardiologist because there's many factors to consider, such as whether the stent was a drug-eluting stent, the length of the stent, and the risk of bleeding. For patients with a coronary stent placed more than one year ago, the Canadian Cardiovascular Society guidelines actually recommend stopping the antiplatelet agent. So that's for patients who have stents. You have to distinguish between a stent in the last year and a stent more than a year ago. And what's very clear is that if a patient's taking aspirin for primary prevention and you're starting them on an anticoagulant for stroke prevention, the aspirin should be stopped because the risk of bleeding outweighs the benefit of aspirin for primary prevention of ischemic events. Let's go back to the case. So we've got this patient who's been cardioverted. They've been started on a DOAC. Let's say they come back to your emergency department a week later with severe diarrhea and vomiting. And you assess them, and their volume depleted, and the creatinine comes back at 180. She's given a liter saline bolus. Her creatinine improves to 145. Dr. Duquetis, so this patient's got kind of acute pre-renal insufficiency from a supposed gastro, let's say. How would you recommend that we manage their anticoagulation? So they've been, they've been taking one of the DOACs, and assuming that they're compliant. That situation is going to arise frequently because a lot of these patients are elderly and are susceptible to these type of illnesses and have some degree of chronic kidney insufficiency. In the case of that you've just described, Anton, I think it's reasonable to maybe withhold a dose or two of the DOAC based on the premise that all of them are eliminated to some degree at least by the kidney. But I don't think it should be a indication to stop the DOAC for a prolonged period of time because in a lot of those cases, the creatinine clearance will improve with hydration. What underpins all of this, though, is the following, is the importance of monitoring renal function over the long term in patients who are receiving a DOAC because we know that these elderly patients, their their kidney function can deteriorate. And if they do, that may have an impact on not only the dose of the DOAC that you're do, giving, but the actual DOAC and, in fact, whether they may be better off on warfarin. So my bottom line is acute kidney injury that's reversible, you can skip a day or two or, or or not bother if it recovers, but if that person has residual kidney disease, continue to monitor and adjust the anticoagulant accordingly. Uh, I totally, totally agree with that. Now, you've got to consider a situation that you're in and where you practice. If you've got a clinic where they can be followed in a day or two and you're sending the patient home, get them seen the clinic in a day or two. If you've got a great family doctor, you know the person, Consider that. Neither of those two, bring them back to your emergency department, check their creatinine or GFR in a day or two. They need early follow-up. That is so, so important. And you're also very well to advise all these patients, if you get bad diarrhea, if you get dehydrated, consider coming to the hospital to get checked out. That would be very sensitive to GFR. So if I could highlight one point, this is, of course, all talking in the context of atrial fibrillation, where generally speaking, the day-to-day risk of uh, of embolization is relatively low. These patients, generally speaking, as Jim's recent trial, for, for example, demonstrated, do not require bridging anticoagulation when uh, they're, they're undergoing therapeutic interruptions for reasons for procedures, for example. However, in the patient who's anticoagulated for an acute venous thrombosis, I would be very hesitant to to advise withholding anticoagulation. Now, of course, if somebody who is on a Pixaban, five milligrams twice a day because they've had a a pulmonary embolism last month, comes into hospital with renal failure on the basis of explosive diarrhea, 
then of course the apixaban should be held for the period of time that their kidney function is compromised. However, those patients still need anticoagulation because they've got a fresh venous thrombosis. And so those patients should probably be admitted for monitoring and should be administered another anticoagulant during the period of time that they're off of their anticoagulant. So it's a great point. Um, I just wanted to talk a little bit about compliance and how we can tell compliance based on the blood work. Because what I used to think was that patients on DOAX, if you do an INRPTT, that they'll be slightly abnormal and that can kind of prove to yourself that they are taking their DOAX. But in researching this topic, I understand that it's a little bit more complicated than that. Uh, Dr. Decatis, could you just explain to us the role of blood work in determining whether someone's actually taking their DOAC or not? Anton, I don't, I don't want to seem to be dogmatic, but there is no role, period, for a full stop. Why, why do I say that? Well, for a number of reasons. First of all, what tests do we do to measure the anticoagulant effect of a DOAC? Some DOACs, like apixaban, you can do an INR or PTT, and it will not reflect its anticoagulant effect. Other DOACs, like the Bigatran, like you just said, you can do a PTT and it may reflect an anticoagulant effect, but then there's a lot of intraassay variability. And then, is, then the other issue is when are you going to measure it? A peak? A trough? How do, in, how do you interpret the test? Do you have to use a more specialized coagulation assay, like a dilute thrombin time for dibigatran or an anti-factor 10A assay? My point is that it's very complicated. We don't know how to really monitor the anticoagulant effect of these newer drugs without using specialized tests. And the bottom line is we don't have to do it in the first place. If we need to assess compliance like we do with anti-diabetic or anti-hypertensive drugs, we, we have to use other, other methods as opposed to trying to get a, an INR and fit that into a DOAC. We just don't have that. We also don't know what the therapeutic range is for these drugs either. Even if you get a dilute thrombin time that gives you a dibigatran level of X or Y, if you get an anti-10A level of X or Y of rivaroxaban or apixaban, we don't really know exactly what the therapeutic levels are for these drugs and what the clinical meaning of those of those results are. Certainly, it might be useful for knowing a patient had taken it within the last 48 hours, I suppose, but we don't really know what a level will mean for an individual patient in terms of stroke prevention. And now for the now Monster, for the monster review. review. The most important patient factors to take into account before starting DOACs or some potential contraindications are extremes of age, extremes of body weight, a GFR less than 30, active cancer, liver failure, pregnancy, a history of bleeding, and drugs that can interact with DOACs like antiplatelet agents, NSAIDs, anticoagulants, amiodarone, macrolides, and antiretrovirals. So you've got to go over this whole list when you're considering starting these drugs in the ED. What about blood tests to detect the effect of a DOAC? Well, INR and PTT are generally not useful for detecting anticoagulation effects of DOACs, while thrombin time may be useful for dibigatran, and antifactor 10A, which is not widely available, may be helpful for apixaban and ribaroxaban. What about DOACs for DVT? Well, DOACs have a fast onset within an hour or two, so they're ideal for those patients with venous thromboembolism who you need to anticoagulate ASAP, and they should be given on spec in patients who you're pretty sure have a DVT if there's a delay to imaging. And what about anticoagulation for isolated calf DVTs? While not all isolated calf DVTs need to be treated, it's important to know that about 15 to 20% of them will propagate proximally. And while there's no robust evidence, our experts recommend anticoagulation treatment for isolated DVTs in the following seven situations. Number one, all three deep veins are involved. Number two, 
The clot is close to the popliteal vein. Number three, the patient has severe symptoms, like a swollen leg and it's warm and hot and tender. Four, the clot is greater than five centimeters in length. Five, the patient's had a DVT in the past. Six, a positive D-dimer. And lastly, progression of the DVT on repeat imaging. Remember that if you really suspect a DVT and a patient has a normal above knee ultrasound, they could still have a fairly significant distal DVT. And so you should repeat imaging in one week for all of those patients. And what about superficial venous thrombosis or thrombophlebitis? Do they require anticoagulation? Well, the first thing to remember is that the superficial femoral vein is not a superficial vein. It's a deep one. And again, while there's no robust evidence, our experts suggest treating superficial vein thrombosis that have severe symptoms, a clot close to the saphenofemoral junction, and clots that are more than five centimeters in length. And remember that the treatment of choice is a one-third to two-fifths dose of the therapeutic dose of low molecular weight heparin not a DOAC. Well, let's talk about dosing for DOACs. So the dose for a DOAC, remember, is fixed for venous thromboembolism, but it needs to be adjusted for renal function and BMI in AFib. So I find it useful to use an app for the dosing. And who needs anticoagulation for AFib? Well, pretty much everyone. Everyone over the age of 65 and everyone with one or more of the CHADS2 factors as long as there's no contraindications, and as long as you've considered the has bled score, which we'll have in the show notes. The efficacy of DOAX in preventing stroke in patients with AFib is at least as good as warfarin with a slightly better safety profile overall. There's less ICH and ICH mortality, but more major GI bleeding. Now, we have lots of patients who come into the emergency department on antiplatelet agents for primary prevention, and sometimes you need to start them on a DOAC. So for those patients, definitely stop the antiplatelet agent. Well, it's a little bit more complicated if they've had a stent placed in the past year. If that's the case, you need to get on the phone and ask a cardiologist for help because it's complicated. And if they've had a stent placed for more than a year, it's probably safe to stop the antiplatelet agent, at least according to the current guidelines. Finally, if a patient comes in on a DOAC in acute renal failure, stop the DOAC until the renal failure is fixed. If they're on a DOAC for something like a PE, it's probably wise to admit them and bridge them with low molecular weight heparin. But if they're on a DOAC for AFib, you probably don't need to bridge them. Just make sure that they have adequate follow-up for repeat creatinine and to make sure they restart their DOAC when their renal function recovers. Well, that about wraps it up for this month's episode. Next month, we'll continue our discussion on DOACs with Drs. Himmel, Bell, and Duquetis with a few challenging cases of bleeding patients that most of us see fairly regularly. And they're going to range from the minor sort of epistaxis kind of bleed to the major ICH. We'll talk about the new reversal agents, when it's safe to stop the DOACs, and a whole lot more. So until next time, here's the quote of the month. It is not the strongest of the species that survives, nor the most intelligent that survives. It is the one that is the most adaptable to change. Now, before you go, if you haven't already, please check out the new Just the Nuggets feature on the EM Cases website, the Crit Cases and Waiting to be Seen blogs, and give us a five-star rating on iTunes if you like what you hear. Now, if you're interested in podcasting yourself, you can't miss the first ever podcasting course in medical education where you'll learn all the tips and tricks about killer medical podcasting from people like Scott Weingart, Jess Mason of MRAP, Rob Rogers, Salim Rizé, Swami, and myself. Just go to thepodcastingcourse.com for all the details. Well, all right, folks. We'll catch you next time. (laughs) 